Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am so glad to have you with me today. My guest is Ellen Kaler. Ellen, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking me to be on with you, Melinda. I've always been a big fan of yours. Well, I'm a big, a big fan of yours as well. And we've known each other for many, many years. And um, so I'm just delighted to have you on my show. Uh, let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. So Ellen Kaler is the executive director of the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. And she was awarded the Con Hogan Award for Creative Entrepreneurial and Community Leadership from the Vermont Community Foundation. She also was awarded the Arthur Gibb Award for Individual Leadership from the Vermont Natural Resources Council and an award with the John Eastman Excellence in Leadership Award from the Snelling Center for Gover Government. And Ellen, when I went on to do my research a few days ago, to start my research on you, there's pages about you. I mean, you, you're an icon here in Vermont. And um, so I hope, I hope I don't want to embarrass you. And I know you're one of the most humble women I know, people I know, but um, your credentials in life's work are outstanding. And there's so much information about you. I could talk to you all day, but we only have a half an hour on this. Interview, so I'm going to jump right in. So Ellen, you grew up in Buffalo. Can you talk to us a little bit about your parents and growing up and the impact that your parents had on you? Sure, sure, happy to. I have uh, I had great parents. My mom is still uh, on the planet. Uh, she was a nurse and uh, for many years, and then uh, took time out from being a nurse to raise us four kids. I have three younger brothers. And after my youngest brother started to be in school full time, she went back and got a second degree in anthropology and then got a master's in um, in uh, communicative diseases and uh, various other things that she was interested in. Epidemiology, that's what it was, not communicative diseases, epidemiology. And um, and she did a lot of work in the Buffalo area supporting the refugee community uh, with getting health care, access to health care, um, because she was just always very motivated by travel and by meeting people from all over the world. And about 25 percent of all of the folks coming into the United States come through Canada through the the entryway in Buffalo. So there was a huge need, especially during uh, you know, the Central American uh, crises when we were at war with uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua, there was in Guatemala, there was just a lot of, of, of folks traveling up through Buffalo. So that was always interesting to hear the stories and tales of, of uh, people that she had met. And my dad uh, was an orthopedic surgeon. He passed about six and a half years ago and um, was a fabulous father, uh, very supportive of us kids. Both of my parents really encouraged us to be who we wanted to be. You know, I just feel so fortunate to have grown up in a household where uh, self-confidence was really instilled in us, you know, that we could be what we wanted to be. We had opportunities um, and, uh, and you know, definitely had privilege that many others didn't have uh, because of our circumstances with what my parents did for work and such. Um, but it was a great childhood. We spent a lot of time out in nature, we spent a lot of time playing sports and uh, overall, you know, I am who I am because of my parents and their parents and uh, my three younger brothers. And you're very, you're, you say you're the only girl in the family. Yes. Are you the oldest? I am, which explains oh a lot. Oh my gosh, that explains <laughs> so much. The oldest sister of three, uh, three younger brothers. Yes, and if you know Myers-Briggs, I'm also an ENTJ and born in April, so I'm an Aries, so it explains a lot. Well, you have tremendous self-confidence and you have tremendous vision. So this that explains a lot. So now I found it really, really wonderful to learn that you were an early entrepreneur because you really are an entrepreneur in, in your life. You you come up with these great ideas and then you make them happen. Um, you, you were an early entrepreneur. You started your own ski tuning business in grade school. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it was not registered, of course. Uh, no, I just, I had gotten, we always, uh, did downhill skiing on the, on the hills of Western New York. It's nothing like the, the hills here in, in mountains here in, in Vermont. But, um, I had just, you know, I had gotten into tuning my own skis and, and talking to other people in my neighborhood, uh, who also skied. They were like, 
yeah, I don't know how to do this. And yeah, my skis have got ruts in them and my edges aren't sharp. So I just, you know, used a little mimeograph uh, maker and I just, you know, made little half page things and stuck it in people's mailboxes. And, you know, I mean, I didn't have very many, many folks take me up on it, but it was, it was fun and it was a good start. And it was, it, it definitely, I think, got me, got me thinking in that kind of entrepreneurial way. Well, it shows who you are. Because that's, that's who you're, you're an ideas person. And then you take the idea and you put it into place. So you were also, as you, as you, as you got older, you also got involved in the anti-nuclear movement. Yeah. Um, and you were spurred by Dr. Helen Caldicott. Um, yes. Talk to us a little bit about that and about the shutting down of Yankee in, here in Vermont. Well, I wasn't involved with the Yankee shutdown at that point. I had, um, I had moved on to the jobs fund and and so had plenty on my plate, but very supportive of of moving in that direction, of course, um, cheerleader on the sidelines on that one. But yeah, back in in college, um Dr. Helen Caldicott, this was the in the you know height of the Cold War, really, the mid and late eighties, um, uh, before the Berlin Wall came down, before the Soviet Union dissolved. Uh, the the rhetoric at that time was still so fierce around the Cold War and 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 the risk of nuclear annihilation. And Dr. Helen Caldicott was is this amazing. She was a pediatrician from Australia, and she um, was so taken by the way that radioactive fallout from the above ground tests before they went underground were impacting mother's milk and and. Uh, children and their health. And so she just became such a champion globally and just traveled tirelessly talking about the risk of nuclear war. And when she came to my campus, uh, when I was a freshman, I just, I got the bug. It just hit me so hard. And I just had that fire in the belly that, wow, we've got to change this. This is not okay. This is, this is scary. This is like, you know, that just really captured me. And that really set me on a course for being an activist for many, many years. And uh, yeah, so how do you feel now? early? So how are you yeah. feeling now with where we are in our world with, um, I mean, do you think we've made strides or do you think we're going backwards? Where do you, how, what's your- Well, we, I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely fewer nukes out there, but I, but I don't think we're anywhere close to having anything, uh, lockdown of, of never happening. I mean, you think about the way that uh, North Korea keeps saber rattling and all of the testing that they are doing um, and how uh, unstable they are. Like, I don't think we're in any way out of, out of danger. Uh, do, you so, that, do you feel that we have an, even an anti-nuclear movement today? No, I don't. Back in your day? It doesn't feel like it to me. Yeah. I mean, do you see That's, anything? I mean, well, no, I mean, our generation, I mean, I don't know I think you're quite a bit younger than I am, but our generation was really, you know, yeah. really in there marching. Now, so so from there, from all of this, from your upbringing, your growth, your mother's influence, um, you you came to Vermont. Um, you used to come to Vermont skiing, and you eventually journeyed your way back here, and you became the executive director of the Peace and Justice Center, and then you yeah. went with Doug Hoffer at the Vermont State Auditor. Talk to us about. Because the Peace and Justice Center must have been, it must have been in, in kind of its early days when you first came up here, yes? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it got started in 1979. And so I joined in 1990, so 11 years in, 12 years in. Um, and uh, Greg Guma was then the, the center director, remember Greg? And Love uh Greg. Yeah. And when I first arrived in September of 1990, I had... Um, I don't know, for whatever reason, Greg saw something in me and he said, well, I've got this bookstore called Maverick Bookstore on College Street. Remember that? And uh, he's like, I need somebody to run that part time. I'm like, OK, sure. I had no idea how to run a bookstore. I had I wasn't even a reader. I never really have been a big reader. So like it was just pretty funny, actually. But it was interesting. It got me in the mix. I got to know a lot of people at the Peace and Justice Center and the Peace and Justice Store. And then eventually uh, all the books um, basically got bought into the, the Peace and Justice Store eventually and Maverick went away. But um, yeah, that's how I got started. And then when Greg, Greg stepped down about nine months after uh, that and I, I just, you know, I applied. I had gotten to know folks. I applied and I got really lucky and they hired me. And I, you know, I was only 23, so they took a big chance on me. And look where they are today and where you are today. So then, then you went to work and I think you said, you know, I think it's Doug Hoffer 
at the Vermont State Auditor. And Doug, as you and I both know, is one, probably one of the most brilliant statisticians, minds. Uh, data this, man. He's I mean, I got to tell you that I've ever met. I mean, he, and so you got to go work with Doug and he got to go work with you. I mean, that was, that must have been a match made in heaven. Well, what happened was actually my mother uh, when it was out in uh, Minnesota at an epidemiological conference and she came upon this thing called the Minnesota Job Gap Study. This was in 1995 and they had just released it. And it was a methodology of calculating basic needs in a livable wage. And, I, and she said, Ellen, I, I think you might be interested in this. So I showed it uh, to, to Jane Nodell and Doug Hoffer and Phil Fermanti and, um, and said, hey, do you think we should do something like this for Vermont? And Doug was like, yeah, this sounds great. He was then working at CEDO office in Burlington, a long way away from being auditor. And um, so I reached out to the Vermont uh, Community Foundation, got a little bit of seed money from them and from uh, when Robbie Harold was at USDA Rural Development, got a little bit of money from her. And we were able to put Doug on contract to basically start working on developing the Vermont version. And then that led to multiple uh, editions of the job gap study, different phases that we did. And that work really, uh, I think, probably defines most, you know, the, the biggest part of my contribution in those days to Vermont with through the Peace and Justice Center was uh, working on that and creating a livable wage campaign around the state, which got a lot of minimum wage increases to happen. It, it led to the to the state legislature actually adopting the basic needs budget and livable wage calculation, which now the joint fiscal office does for the state every two years so that the legislature has that document for policy purposes. And, um, you know, and, and uh, Doug as an independent uh, financial and economic analyst uh, went on to really support a lot of legislative uh, conversations around policy and using data. And, and now of course he's, He's been the state auditor for many, many years. You must be familiar with the Change the Story reports. Yes, yes, of course. And uh, I was actually on the board of of um, Vermont Works for Women when Tiff Bloomley was the executive director for many years. And so, um, yeah, that was a, another great piece of work that that uh, Tiff was able to project manage through. And we and we have and we have so much more work to do for yes. less wage and for equality for women. And I mean, those reports were, I was on the Vermont Commission um, for Women back then. And, um, but anyway, so thank you for that incredible work um, that you did. Well, the funny thing is it's never done, right? That's, that's the point here. So this past, just literally this past fall, uh, one of the things that happened in, with the legislature last session was that we had a number of us really pushed hard that that um, the basic needs budget needed to be re reviewed, the methodology needed to be reviewed. It had been since 2008. And so there was a summer study committee and I was on it along with some other really terrific people, um, Allison Clarkson, Senator Allison Clarkson chaired it. Um, and so we spent five sessions really going through that methodology. Uh, and now there's going to be some updates for the next uh, report. But the funny thing was, you know, Doug and I were talking a lot and we we're like, wait a minute, we, like we did this 25 years ago. How is that even possible? You know, so it just goes to show you that there's some stuff that just really does take a long time. It does. It takes it takes forever, actually. And we can never we can never uh, let down our guard. Um, so thank you for talking about that, because that was something I wanted to dig into as a livable wage. Um, so, see, so you also went off to Harvard to study at the Kennedy School of Government, right? Yeah, that was just that was just for a year. I needed to have a little bit of a break from uh, after I left the Peace and Justice Center, and I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do next. And uh, Jan Eastman, who was then running the Snelling Center for Government, and um, people like David Tucker and Lisa Lorimer and some others said, you know, Ellen, it's time for you to leave the Peace and Justice Center. And, and I and when I and when they said that to me in 2001, I was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do next. And they're like, well, you should go to the Kennedy School and get a, a master's in public policy in uh, public administration. They have a great one year program. So I was like, OK. <laughs> so 
you know, it was a it was a wonderful experience. Uh, the MPA, the mid career MPA program there is phenomenal. And what, what one of the things that's so magical about it is that about forty to forty five percent of the class every year are international students. So you're in classes with people who are like going to be the president of Ghana someday, or like people that are running, you know, that are long term diplomats or policy leads in, at NASA or, you know, folks that are in the Israeli uh, military in a, in a policy level, like, like the, the, this, the, the, the incredible people that you get to meet at the Kennedy school is truly amazing. And it, um, uh, you, you know, you're having these case study discussions about all these world problems and, it's just, it's a phenomenal window into really learning more about the world and how people tick and how leaders are forged and, and, and all that. So it was a great experience. And the thing that I learned, you know, I really went into that very open and uh, tr to try to see what would arise. What did I want to do next? And what kept coming up was economic justice. And so that's, that's what I came are. back and that's that what I came back to do. And that's where you landed. And we and all of us in Vermont are so fortunate. We're talking to Ellen Kaler, who is the executive director of the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. And for all of my viewers, I, I encourage you to go to VSJF, VSJF.org and check out their website. It's it's a great website. So Ellen, let's move into this. So you started the peer-to-peer -peer collaborative. Um, talk to us about that um, that program. Yeah, so when I when I left uh, the Kennedy School and came back to Vermont, I had this seed of an idea um, that I actually was born out of a number of conversations I had with Lisa Lorimer, who then was the CEO at Vermont Bread Company. And she always talked about how having an advisory board was some of the best things that she ever did as a CEO, because having outside eyes of, of other people who are really committed to Vermont Bread Company succeeding and her as the CEO, but who had that outside perspective, she always found that incredibly valuable. And my supposition was that if you looked at the most successful businesses in Vermont, uh, many of whom were members of Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, doing the best good in the state um, as a company, uh, that they all had had advisory boards or they had some kind of coaches or mentors or something like that. So, and they were also the best paying and had the best benefits and the best workplace culture. So I was putting these things together and I was like, well, what would it look like if we actually stood up a project where we had, in essence, people serving as advisory board members temporarily for companies and we work with them over a 12, 18 month period to help them work on their business and they would pay part of the cost of that. And then that would give me the inside understanding of what are the barriers to paying livable wages, right? Because back during those days when I was giving lots of talks about basic needs budgets and livable wages, everyone, every, doesn't matter the political ideology across the board. Everyone's like, well, of course, if you're working full time, you should be able to pay your bills. Like, of course, that's just fair. That's just right. And so so many business owners were like, I totally believe in this and I don't know how, or they thought that they were paying level wages, like honestly, really thought that they were. So I wanted to better understand, well, what's what's getting in the way? What is there some structural part of the way businesses are set up or the way they function or something that got in the way of them paying better wages and benefits? And so the peer-to-peer -peer collaborative was a way to do that. And so I came back and I pitched the idea. I went in and I saw Lisa Ventress, who had just for a year had been in the role of at the Vermont Business Roundtable as the president. And I pitched the idea and I said, yeah, I'm looking to figure out like, where should I land with this? And what do you think? And she's like, well, how about if we incubate you for two years out of our office? And I think that a lot of our members would be very interested in this and giving back and being part of the, the, the team. So that's what she did. She pitched it to her board. So I had a home base for two years, a free office space, a copier, a phone, internet. And I tried to make a go of it for two years to have enough, enough clients to support myself. And at that time, all of the, the 
uh, folks that that I had recruited to serve in this in this advisor role um, were doing it for free, and uh, so it just wasn't sustainable ultimately. So when the, the position opened up at uh, the Vermont Stable Jobs Fund in, in uh, November of or the fall of it was 2005. 2005, right? Yeah, I applied for that. And then I was lucky enough to get that job. And I brought the notion of the collaborative peer to peer collaborative with me right. to the jobs fund. So that now has morphed into what our is now our coaching program, business coaching program. But that was the seed of it, actually. And, you know, had Lisa Ventress not been there to, to say, hey, I, I like this idea. Let's let's do this. You know, it probably never would have happened. Well, and a lot of those businesses weren't necessarily businesses that were Vermont businesses for social responsibility. I mean, they were businesses that really could benefit from this program. Well, let's move into this. Uh, your job that you've had now for the past 19 years, yeah. 2005, you did become the executive director of the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. Um, share with us how this program came to be and what it does for Vermonters and talk about your creation in particular, because we're going to go through some of your programs that you've that you that you're working on, but the creation of the farm to plate network. Yeah. So, so and actually, by the way, can I just add to what moved you into agriculture, which seems to be the direction that you went? And I know you grew up surrounded by a lot of farms and stuff, but what what excited you about agriculture too? Share with that with our folks. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, let me do that one in a minute. I'll just say for the Stable Jobs Fund was actually uh, created by an act of the legislature in 1995. And that happened because a number of people in Vermont businesses for social responsibility and business owners like Kevin Harper and uh, Allison Hooper and such really believed that there was a need to have some other entity who could focus on certain sectors of the economy. And in their, and what they wanted to see was more sort of the natural resource base, those kinds of, of sec business sectors like ag and food and forest and energy that were like place-based and where we had some ability to, to, to foster and nurture uh, those types of businesses. And it, part of it was because the, and this is, this is still true to today, in state government, I mean, the Department of Economic Development, the regional development corporations, you know, they all do good work and they have to respond to everybody. That's just in their mandate. They they can't pick and choose. They have to be there in service to all types of businesses. And so this group of, of VBSR members and such really felt that there was a would be a benefit to the state to have some entity that could focus on these particular sectors. So that's why we got created in 1995. And, uh, you know, it, there was, uh, Wayne Fawbish was the uh, original okay. uh, executive director. And they had, back in the, those days, they had a small pool of funds that they really just did grant making with. They, it was early and it was prior to the, the community foundation really, like really growing its asset base. So it was one of the few kind of business oriented funders. And so they funded a lot of really great initiatives so when I uh, came on board, we were at an inflection point in the organization and the board really wanted to better, you know, after 10 years of sort of some trial and error, what, 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 um, what should we focus on? And, um, and so that's when I stepped in and we were very small um, and we've grown now. We're about th 13 employees. Uh, now we were at like three when I started um, very, very small budget. And, uh, this year I think we'll be on track to have about a $2.7 million budget. So, right. but then to your point about agriculture. So, um, we had got, done a bunch of work looking at biofuels, like growing, growing oilseed crops, growing grasses, perennial grasses to create, uh, fuels that farms could use to, to fuel their operations and or potentially heat homes in the, in the form of grass. Uh, perennial grasses. And um, VBSR, again, along with rural Vermont in 2009, approached the legislature having the sense that it would be really, really helpful to have a strategic plan for the state around food, uh, strengthening the farm and food sector. So they approached the legislature and said, hey, we think there should be some more planning. This is like right when the recession was was really hitting hard. So there was a lot of, of layoffs in state government, the agency of ag 
was, you know, really reduced in size and capacity. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of turmoil in the dairy, another dairy crisis with prices. But then there was all this exciting stuff happening with farmers markets and CSAs and farm to school. And, and so the legislature was kind of perplexed, like what's going on? You know, we've got dire straits in one so part of this the account of the, the sector and all this hope and optimism and young people enthusiasm on the other like tell us what's going on here so they approached me and said would you be interested in in doing this and i uh, naively said sure <laughs> so they provided a little bit of money and um we were on our way with that what ultimately became known as the Vermont Farm to Plate initiative it's, it's in statutes called the Farm to Plate Investment Program. It's under our regular statute. And um, yeah, we've been doing that a big part of our work ever since. It's, it's a million dollar program that we're, we're managing at this point. That's incredible. You're also working with Vermont Tech to create graduates who can create jobs in the growing agricultural and food sectors, um, right? Well, yeah, I mean, back in 2020, in April 2020, then uh, Chancellor Jeb Spaulding announced uh, the idea that maybe the Vermont, the Randolph campus at Vermont Tech should be closed. And I was like, wait a minute, you, you can't do that. Like, we need to graduate. We need more people being graduated in farm and food type degrees because we have all these employers that are expanding and they can't get enough workers. Like you can't shut this down. So I reached out to then president Pat Moulton and said, Hey, what do you think about if I were to pull together a group of people to work with you to really re-envision what the ag and food program could be like at Vermont tech, would you be open to that? So she thought about it and she said, yes, which I'm grateful for. And I pulled together about 40 of us to all volunteers uh, to work over the next uh, year to come up with a transformation plan for that program. And um, then unfortunately, there's been a lot, it, everything has really slowed down because of the consolidation of creation of Vermont State University. But, uh, but the good news is, I think we're, it, we've turned a corner we now have at, at, at uh, VTSU Randolph, there's been a, um, a director, an executive director named uh, Glenn Evans, who's been hired to run the new Center for Agriculture and Food Entrepreneurship. And uh, it's not accepting students yet, but it's in the revitalization, retransformation stage. And I'm hopeful that by the, the academic year of 2025, that we'll have a new crop of students starting to go through there. And uh, that would be awesome. So, so you also have been working with the legislature on a job creation program, creating a higher level of coordination in our workforce development um, for jobs that aren't just in the agricultural sector, right? Yeah, I mean, the reason that we, we get involved in workforce development type initiatives at the systems level is because all of the businesses in the sectors that we work with are all facing workforce challenges. So I um, have been on the state workforce development board for many years and um, worked and I and I've just been, you know, I think in systems so like I see big picture system stuff. And so what I see in the in the workforce system is a lot of really amazing people, a lot of really very impactful programs and a real lack of coordination and uh, connectivity, a lot of folks working in silos. And that's how the ag system and the food system was when we when it first started and when we first started Farm to Plate in 2009. And so uh, I just, you know, I've just offered to be supportive in any way that I can and have worked with a number of legislators who were also very frustrated with that lack of coordination. And so, uh, there's been a summer study committee uh, that just released its report. It was actually a two-year group um, of five five folks. Senator Clarkson was on it, and um, um, the chair was uh, Representative Mike Marcotte from the Commerce Committee, and Adam Grinnell from representing the um, State Workforce Development Board. He's the chair was on it, as well as Kendall Smith from uh, the Governor's Office and Jay Ramsey from the Department of Labor. So the five of them hired uh, uh, consultants to work with them to really understand, well, what would it look like to, to really have a coordinated workforce system? 
And so right now there are a couple of bills in the state, in the state house and in, in the legislature that are being considered uh, that if we're successful could lead to the creation of an office of, of workforce uh, development and expansion, which I think could provide that level of coordination that's been missing in the system. So and I've more, just been trying to help any way I can with just, it. you know, thinking and all that. You've had your fingers in so many things. And I have, I have like six more pages that <laughs> we've gone through, but we're actually running out of time here. So have you seen the series, You Are What You Eat? Um, and it's 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 on Netflix and it's a four episode series and it's basically, um, you know, analyzing and looking at the meat and dairy uh, impact on climate and how our how our society is moving towards a more plant based focus. And in that I wanted to ask you about, you know, the hope that you have for Vermont with climate change and how we have to sort of change what we're doing and and, and I'm sure you're involved in, in things related to that, but have you seen that series? And do you think Vermont can move away from a dairy uh, meat uh, economy over the next 10 or 15 years to more of a plant-based economy? I have not seen that uh, series. I've seen a lot of good foods, food shows. Uh, High on the Hog is one of my favorites actually on Netflix right now. Um, but um, no, I haven't seen that particular series, but I, I would say this, you know, we are, um, the reason that our landscape uh, of farm fields and farms surrounded by forests looks the way they do is because of animal agriculture, which is dairy and other forms of livestock. So if dairy and other forms of livestock were to be, be diminished, it would look very different here physically. So I think it's more in my mind, what's important. And this is really where the agency of agriculture, the Laura Ginsburg, who's managing at the agency of the Dairy Business Innovation Center, for instance, some significant funding from USDA um, that's come to the state and the region. And the work that I've been uh, doing both with Farm to Plate, but also with the, a, new, a new regional effort called New England Feeding New England is really to take a more balanced approach. You know, it's not about specializing on any one type of, of product. It's really about, you know, think about climate change. You think about resilience. Well, what does resilience? It means that you can bounce back quickly. Well, if you're only producing one or two things, like monoculture, like the way they do in the Midwest with corn, wheat, and soy, you have a major climate disruption and you you could be wiped out. You know, we, we saw that this summer with the summer floods, how many vegetable farmers got completely wiped out at the, at the height of their, uh, of their growing season. So I actually think that the, 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 the thing we need to be doing is, is diversifying the, the product mix uh, and and also as much as we can value add to it, because that's how uh, farms and food businesses can really thrive economically um, and be around for the long haul um, is if we're not so dependent on any one commodity. And I if you think if you look back at the data from uh, 2009, when we first started Farm to Plate to today, the dairy we, we, we said in the first strategic plan, we really thought that the opportunity for dairy was around value added. And they've actually picked, uh, th that has happened. We have more people today are consuming dairy, but it's in the form of cheese and yogurt and other types of, of dairy products. And as opposed to, even though fluid milk has continued to drop. And then there's, you know, I think grass base is also really important, right? We don't have CAFO feedlots like the West does. And I think that's our value add. I don't think we're going to get people to stop eating meat, but if we get, if they can eat healthier, better meat that's humanely raised, humanely processed, on grass, th that ha also has positive well, climate impacts. Well, grass-fed meat and dairy also it has a lot of omega three. I mean, as as the good absolutely. Fats. So that I mean, the whole thing is about how. So so we're coming to a close of this show, which I could go on for twenty hours with you. What words of wisdom do you have for our children today, Ellen, in the world that they're growing up in? Um, it's cultivate self-confidence, you know, believe in yourself, believe in your ability to 
um, live, a, live a good life, to do the things that inspire you, to get out there and just take stuff on and to remain hopeful because, you know, there's a lot of really negative stuff out there in the press. I would say get off social media, <laughs> you know, stop, stop bullying and get off social media and do things that are positive, that are about community, that are about your family, that are about your friends and neighbors, about your state and about the world. Because, um, Unfortunately, a lot of us have contributed to the circumstances we're in with climate change and and the political uh, craziness of today. And uh, we, you know, it's always been the the next generation that has a way of shaking things up and making things better. So it's really that's a big part of what we need to be focusing on is how do we help the you know the the Gen Zers and the millennials step into leadership and. Uh, really help us to get out of the mess that we're in. Truly, because we're moving on. Well, Ellen, you are you're you're a change maker. Uh, you're a person who people turn to when they want new ideas, new visions. But not only are you a great thinker, you you make stuff happen, and you take what you see and you've actually put it into practice. And all of us in Vermont have benefited from the years that you have been here and that you've done this great work. So I wanna thank you for all of that. I wanna thank, thank you, you. For my friend. I admire you so much. And um, and so thank you for being on my show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, thanks for having me. I, I'm a big admirer of yours as well. Everything that you've, you've done down at the waterfront and Main Street Landing is just truly transformational for the city of Burlington. So, and your leadership in VBSR all these years. I mean, you have been a real, uh, voice of what's possible and and our doer change maker right back at you. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to my viewers, I want to thank you for joining us today. And I hope that you're doing well and I will see you very soon. Bye bye.